Amen. There might be some joy right now if we could get something out of the Word of God. Amen. 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 So I would invite your attention, if you have such a thing, this morning to the book of John, chapter number 12. Book of John, chapter number 12. Let's stand, if we could, and read a few verses of Scripture together. We're going to begin reading in verse number 42. John chapter 12, <clears throat> verse number 42 and following. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world, at least this time. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Father, we pray that you'd be with us this morning for a few minutes as we gather together. We pray this morning, Lord, that you would just bless your word. You gave it to us, gave it to us for a purpose, and we just pray that you would bless it this morning. Thank you for each and every one that's come out to be here today. We'd ask, Lord, that you'd give them a blessing for having been here, and we pray that they might be able to take that blessing with them, bless somebody else. Thank you for all the things that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. We have two classes of people mentioned here. In verse number 44, we have believers. He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. So we're talking about believers. And we're talking about some who believe not. If any man, in verse 47, if any man hear my words... And believe not, I judge him not. Now, <clears throat> if we just read the Bible and we just read, look, take your concordance and look up the word believe or believer, and you would just read through the Bible and read all the references that said believe or believer, you might not be able to come to a really good conclusion as to who those words were exactly talking about. Because the word believe... Normally, in Scripture, the word believe is a word that means believe. It means to give mental assent to. It means to say, yes, this is the way things are. That's, it's, um, I forget the Strong's number, but if you look it up, it'll say, that's basically what it will say. It will go on to give some other more particular definitions depending on context. That's why context in Scripture is very important. Because what we have here when we start, we, we, without Jesus is not talking when we begin this. This is the Holy Spirit talking. It says, nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. If you stop right there, what have you got? You've got believers. Right? Believers. So what are these particular believers doing? Well, but because of the Pharisees... They did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So no matter how you cut this, and I know we don't like it sometimes, but there are believers who are not believers. Yeah. That's true. Amen. The Bible tells us that the devils believe. Right. And they're better than humans because they believe and they tremble. And a lot of humans don't do that. So we have two classes. We have these believers who 
are questionable believers. It's kind of like the parable of the sower. You know, everybody wants, nowadays, when you preach the parable of the sower, everybody that preaches it, preaches like everybody's saved. It's just that they produce different things. But I'm not sure in the parable of the sower, actually the only category that you know for sure is saved is the one that brings forth fruit. The last one. The other categories are nice to preach about, and it would be nice to wish that they would be in the kingdom of God, but I wouldn't want to be one of those because there's no guarantees. So here we have some people so in the synagogue, chief rulers, who perhaps understand that, you know what, this guy, there's something special about this guy. He fits in. I mean, he... he you can preach the prophecies, and he, he fulfills the prophecies, and, and he doesn't speak like any other man, and he has authority when he talks, and all of these things. And so, yeah, I, you know, I believe that there's a Jesus. I believe that he may have even been born in Bethlehem. I, there are a lot of things that I believe about Jesus. But guess what? I'm not going to confess any of those. That's kind of a dangerous place to be. A believer that won't confess. So there are those that believe and those that believe not. But we're going to discuss here both. But we're, when you talk about believers, we're talking about true believers. As if you have to put the word true with it. It's kind of like being really saved. You, know. um, you can be really lost. But you can only be saved once, looking forward, as the pastor's been teaching us, to the fulfillment of that. But there is such a thing as salvation. Here we are discussing true believers, heart believers, soul believers, and true unbelievers, lost believers, judged unbelievers. So they are. there are some believers who are not necessarily believers, and some of those are among the chief rulers. Mental assent is not heart belief. And I don't want to parse words here. I don't want to get anybody confused, but just because we believe something doesn't make it true. Have you ever believed anything that was not true? Have you ever been a politician? <laughs> You know, nowadays it seems like people believe a lot of stuff that cannot possibly be true. So I, I won't get into all of that, but just, just as an example. So mental assent is not heart belief. They, they did not confess him. Why? Because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Dangerous place to be. Loving the praise of men more than the praise of God. They loved their friends. They loved the world. They loved their position. They loved being in the chief place in the synagogue. They loved having the role passed around to them every week so they could read it and so they could give forth their explanation or their interpretation of the scriptures, and so they could have their little party every week, and they could get together, and they could wear their, their uh, robes, and they could go around, and people would say, oh, there's a Pharisee. You know, that word used to have a good connotation. It doesn't have such a good connotation anymore, does it? Now, we throw it around like an epithet, you know, you Pharisee. <laughs> you know, but back in the day, those, these were good people. They were looked up to. Even if they were hypocrites, they, on the outside, they looked pretty good. And they tried to do the right thing. Sometimes they got a little carried away. John chapter 9 and verse 22 says, um, These words spake his parents. They're talking about the lame man that was healed. In John chapter 9 and verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already 
that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. So why didn't these men confess <clears throat> that he was Christ? Because it says they will be put out of the synagogue. And they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. I mean, who wants to get kicked out of church? Amen? People, that's not, that's not a good thing. I don't like to get kicked out of church. Sometimes we don't want to go to church, but we don't want to get kicked out. No, that's not a good thing. And so that's why if any man confessed that he was Christ, then they'd be put out of the synagogue. Matthew 10, 32 says, Christ talking says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Sounds to me like if we're not, if we, if we can't bring ourselves to confess that Christ is Christ, then he might not be able to bring himself to confess that we're one of his. No matter what we might think we believe up here. Because what you believe will affect what you do. If you believe that the medicine that the doctor gave you will fix you, then you'll take the medicine. If you don't believe that it will fix you, you'll leave it on the table. And in, in most cases, in three weeks, you'll be better either way. <laughs> but they charge you for medicine, and so you should take it, right? Because then it expires, and you've wasted your money. We don't like to do that. So we don't want him not confessing us. And, and the next verse, Matthew 10, 33 says, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So we have the real Jesus Christ telling us here that we should be confessors of him. We should confess that he is the Christ. We should be willing to at least say that much, right? If someone were to ask you, but if someone were to ask these people, they would have said, um, I don't think so, if they were in the synagogue. Now, maybe if they were in just the right company, they might say yes. Dangerous ground. Dangerous ground to walk on. Scripture indicates that confession is the result of salvation. And although some people might believe some certain things with their minds, they may not believe it enough to confess it. And this is kind of dangerous ground to walk. So I want to look at just a couple of things here this morning. First of all, verse number 47. Man must hear. Man must hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him what? Hear. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Men must hear. In order for men to hear, they must have the opportunity to hear. That's why we do what we do. It's so that men will have the opportunity to hear. Can we make men hear? No. Why? Because we do not control the ears. I know they have such a thing nowadays as implants that you can put in your ears. But those implants do not have a wire to your heart. They're just implants. It's not going to make you hear spiritual things any better than it would have made you hear them before. But we need people to hear, and in order for them to hear, they must have the opportunity to hear. Not everyone is going to darken the doors of a church building. Not everyone is going to show up on Sunday morning to your place just because perhaps you invited them. 
Not everyone is going, to, is going to believe what you say. And so the opportunity has to be given, not just here, but out there. Somewhere out there, if people are going to hear, they have to have the opportunity to hear. And we strive to make that happen. We, uh, we preach the gospel. We send missionaries around the world. We have tracts out there that you can take and leave on the table when you eat lunch or hand out to people in parking lots. Uh, we have times for preaching, and preaching doesn't just involve preachers. It involves anyone who can confess. Amen? Amen? Because I know, you know, it's, it's not, preaching It's not necessarily easy. And, and most people, when they come to hear preaching, they want to hear something that is relatively cogent and put together. And so, you know, that's a whole art and science in itself. People that go to school for those things have big, long words to describe it and can take homiletics and hermeneutics and all of the, the science of preaching. I don't know about all of that, but I know that you need preaching in order for the word of God to go out and have effect. So we need opportunities for people to hear. But you're here this morning, so you at least have an opportunity. So you're not going to be able to stand before God and say, I never had an opportunity. Even if you got up and left now, he's still, you don't get out, you know. Opportunities. So for a man to believe, he must hear, and for him to hear, he must have opportunity. Because Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so we have to have the word of God, and we have to have it presented in some form or fashion. And men have to have the opportunity to hear it. Or it's not going to be able to have any effect. So if you're here today, you're hearing with your ears, if you have ears. Do we have, I was gonna, do we have any deaf people here? If you have deaf people, raise your hand. <laughs> and so most people here, I think, can hear. Some people can't hear. That's why we have sign language. I have a daughter who, who can do sign language because she loses her voice a lot, can't talk, and so she can't communicate with her daughter unless they use sign language. So that's what they use. Very efficient, and you can present the gospel that way. But because you can have ears that are not necessarily ears. Because the ears that you need to hear the gospel are not up here, they're down here. And so the gospel must be presented and then you have to apply that hearing to your heart something has to happen between the sound that goes into your head and the spirit that touches your heart and only the spirit of god can do that there is no baptist preacher on the face of the earth that can make that happen no matter how well studied they are, no matter how good they are, no matter how many big words they use or how well their sermon is put together, none of that's going to happen unless the Spirit of God is involved in that process. So if we sit there and we are already determined that we're going to come to church because we want to come to church, but we're not going to confess outside, and so we don't want to hear anything, then you're not going to hear anything. You'll just be wondering, how long is he going to go on? When are we going to get out? Where are we going to go to lunch? What happens next? Do I have to come all the way back here next week? <laughs> all of those things. What we should be asking ourselves is, when I hear this, do I really believe? Do I believe what I'm hearing? Well, you don't take everything right as it's spoken for granted. You know, you can do some studying, you know, look it up. No preacher worth his salt is going to say, 
you know, just take what I say. No, no. Just look it up. See what you think. Mull it over. The more you think about stuff, the more chance that it has to get to your heart. Because if you don't think about it at all, it's not going to go anywhere. If we just hear a bunch of words and that's it, it's not, it's not going to do anything. We have to hear it. Do I really believe? If I heard that, do I really believe it? If I believe it, do I believe it enough to confess? Christ said in verse 45 of our text, He that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. So a man has to not only hear, but has to what? See. So now we have hearing and seeing. We don't want to abide in darkness. What kind of sight are we talking about? Once again, we can have blind people can hear the gospel, right? And blind people can see. They can see spiritually. They can see the things that they need to see. I've often wondered, and I've never really talked to anyone who has been blind since birth. I've talked to several people who are blind and got blind after birth. But if someone is blind from birth, what kind of pictures do they get in their head as to what they're seeing? I mean, wouldn't that be an interesting conversation? Because they probably wouldn't even be able to describe it to you. Well, I, in my head, I see a car, but you don't know what a car looks like. I see a building, but you don't know what a building looks like. So imagine people who have, are blind from birth, and a lot of people who are blind from birth are really talented. You have great piano players that are blind from birth. How, they don't even know what a piano looks like. You know, as Gordon Moat says, all the keys are black to me. <laughs> He's a pretty good piano player. He doesn't have to know what color the keys are. He can just know where they are. But he's heard. At least he seems to have. And he believes. And he sings to the Lord. Writes music. Plays the piano. A man has to see. Not abiding in darkness. We have to be able to see the light of Jesus. And scripture tells us that he is the light of the world. Amen? We should be able to see that. He's the light of the world. This is not hidden somewhere. This is the light of the world. You see light out there? Amen. Who made that? Amen. Jesus made that. Amen. Paul said you can look around at the creation and you can tell that there's a God. Amen. Why? Because there's stuff out there. And you didn't make it. God made it. The government didn't make it, as amazing as that may seem. God made it. And he put it here just for us. There's no other reason that he put it here except for us. So we need to be able to see the light of Jesus. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. With him, Scripture says, is no darkness at all. Right. No darkness at all. And in the eternal city, guess what? No darkness. Because the Lamb is going to be the light. And there's not going to be any darkness. So we started in darkness in the book of Genesis, and we end up with no darkness whatsoever. All because of the Lord. 1 John 1, 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. So whatever we can find out about God, it's light. It's something that we should be able to see, something that we should be able to identify with. Because in him is no darkness at all. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse number 3 says, And the Gentiles shall come to thy, what? Guess. Light. 
The Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Conversion of Saul, Acts chapter 22, as he's giving his testimony, it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, this is always this is always kind of interested me. Because if he's coming to Damascus about noon, what probably is there already? Light. Right? It's noon. You're probably not going to get much more light than that because it's noon. Okay? So, as I made my journey and was come right nigh on Damascus about noon, just because God wants me to know that light is not all light, suddenly there shone from heaven a great what? Light round about me. So even though all of that light that God made was there, he said, tell you what, Paul, I'm going to show you light. <laughs> and guess what? He did. It wasn't any ordinary light. But it caused Paul to fall down. People who lose their physical sight can still have this kind of sight. They can still see light. They can still, still see spiritual light. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. That's a lot of light. You know why he gave that light? He gave that light so that you and I could see that light. And seeing that light so that it could penetrate our darkness. And so that we would be able to see. Because we have this crazy idea that if we can see outside and it's bright outside that there's light. But that's not necessarily the kind of light that we need. We need his light. And his light is a lot different than some light. So, a man must hear, a man must see, and then a man must believe. There are probably so many scriptures we almost couldn't count them if you, every time the word is believe is used. If you have one of those electronic concordances on your phone, and you put in believe and you hit enter, it will probably say, well, this, the limit goes to whatever the limit goes to, but there's more than that. It says on mine, I think it's 100. So uh, by the time you get through like Exodus, you're through 100 of the word believe. Um, believe. A man must believe. You know, Adam and Eve had a perfect environment with perfect surroundings. And they were made in the image of God. But when the snake talked to Eve, what did he do? He managed to affect her belief. Because he questioned what God had said. She had the right answer the first time. God said, we're not supposed to eat of that tree. Satan said, yeah, has God said? And so we begin the doubt process. We must believe. Eve didn't believe God, really, when that conversation was over. 
We have some that did. Noah believed God. God told Noah, came down and told Noah, remember it had never rained before. God came down and told Noah to build an ark because it was going to rain. That word might not have even been in his language. It would be like having the English language without the word rain in it. So God says, Noah, I just want you to know that I want you to build an ark in your backyard because it's going to rain. Where did God put that word? He put it in his heart. He put it in Noah's heart. Because Noah understood and confessed to his family that we're going to build an ark because that's what God said. And God says it's going to rain and I believe it. And guess what? It rained. Oh, it didn't just rain. It rained and rained. And then it rained some more. Lots of rain. So Eve didn't believe God, but Noah did believe God. How do we know? How do, how do we know that one was a believer and one wasn't? Because one obeyed and one did not. Really, when you come right down to it, it's pretty simple, isn't it? How many times in the scripture do you, do you read the term obey the gospel? That's the same as believe the gospel. If you believe the gospel, you obey the gospel. Otherwise, we don't really believe the gospel. Right? Hearing, seeing, knowledge, believing... Just turn uh, back a couple of pages in your Bible to the book of Mark, chapter number one. Verse number 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the what? Gospel of the what? Kingdom of God. And this here is the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So what's the command? Repent ye... And believe what? The gospel. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? It's pretty straightforward. The time is fulfilled. It's time for the Messiah to come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Because that's in the control of the Father sent by the, and, and sent with the Son. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Turn around from what you're doing and believe the good news that the kingdom is at hand. And that Christ is the head of it. Christ is the Messiah. Christ is the promised one. Christ is the one who was promised to come and take away the sins of the world. Repent and believe. So you don't get to just believe without repenting. You say, what does that mean? Well, it means several things. It means obey. It means turn from what you're doing. So God knows that we're not doing the right thing. So he says, you need to repent. You need to what? Turn. Turn. The old dictionaries used to call it a turning with sorrow from a past sinful course of action. Repentance. That's repentance. Now, I know we go to the Greek nowadays and we change it to just, well, it's a change of mind. Okay, so you take your fuzzy change of mind, but if you put that into practice, what does it do? It changes what you do. If you change your mind about what you believe, it will change what you do. Repent ye and believe 
the gospel because the time is fulfilled. Romans 4.24 says, But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Believe. In Romans 10.9, we all probably know, says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be saved. So, people have to hear. And to hear, you have to be presented with the gospel. And people have to see with their spiritual eyes. And people have to believe what they hear and what they see. In order for that gospel to have an effect on your life and make a difference. The gospel will make a difference in your life. If the gospel has not made a difference in your life, you need to check up on your salvation because the gospel will make a difference in your life. Where do we stand? What is our category? If Jesus were here and talking about us and he said the same thing, and by the way, Jesus is pretty consistent. I don't think Jesus would not change his message just because he came today. You know, the message doesn't change. If he came today and preached the same things, he would be called a hater. Be called someone who doesn't love everybody. You're trying to get us to change how we do things. And he would say, only if you believe. He didn't, he says, I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. So saving the world is what? It means changing the world. Because saved people are changed people. So he came to change the world. Well, if he's going to change the world, how's he going to do that? He's going to do that one gospel reception at a time. Because people, individuals, have to hear. And individuals have to see. And individuals have to believe. Have we heard? Have we seen? Have we believed? That happens at a particular time in your life. You don't just kind of grow into it. Because that's what these people were doing. They were growing into it. But the problem was they wouldn't confess anything. Because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. The unbelievers are in the other category. Verse 47, And if any man hear my words, so we're still hearing, we're still in the hearing business. If any man hear my words and believe not, so guess what? There are some people who hear and will believe, and there are some people who will hear and believe not. And those that believe are the confessors, and those that don't believe are the non-confessors. And those that believe are the ones that will be changed, and those that don't believe are ones that will not be changed. And it's hard to hang on to something that's not there. No, I haven't been changed, and I'm not being changed well things that are not changed are still the same that must be a law of physics or something if it's not changed it's still the same and you don't need to be the same you need to be different we don't need to be the same old man we need to be a new man and the scripture tells us that in Christ we are what new new there's a new creature. 
There's, dif- there's a difference. Something has changed. I'm not the same as I used to be. I have a testimony of salvation. And you shouldn't be ashamed of that, by the way. You should have a testimony of salvation. And you shouldn't have to be ashamed of that. The unbelievers are the rejectors. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, verse 48. The unbelievers are the judged. The same shall the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him at the last day. You know, Christ doesn't have to change his word for you and I. We believe it or we reject it. What's your category? If they could look at at just this scripture, where's our category? Are we confessors? Are we believers? Are we judged? Are we... Where's the time that you believed? Because there should be one. And if not, there's nothing stopping you from doing that today. There's nothing stopping you from believing today. The gospel is still brand new today. It's still here today. If Jesus were here today, there's a good chance he would preach the gospel. Amen? Because that's what he did. He went around preaching the gospel. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Well, guess what? The same thing needs to be preached today. Repent and believe. Believe that he came. Believe that he wants to change you. Believe that he's going to be, that he's going to be the judge of everything in the world. Believe that he's going to be the one on the throne. Believe that he's the one that came and died and went to a cross so that we don't have to be judged when he wraps all of this up. We don't have to be. We can be in him. In him. Amen? Let's all stand. Brother Adam, you come lead us in a...